Mm-hmm. Talk to me. Talk to you. Yeah, just ignore that. Goes away. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Start off by telling me your name, where you live, and what you do. Where I live? What's it? Well, it's a I don't know. Uh, Jeff West, executive director of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. That's what I do. Uh, what, what does an director, executive director do? Is that your question? No. Well, okay. You live in Dallas. Or I live in Dallas. Live in uh, Stevens Park, Oak Cliff. And are you a native Dallas? I've uh, been here for 20 years, so almost. That's a joke. See, so it's kind of you know whatever. Anyway, 20 years though. So. What yeah. Hmm? What um, <clears throat> my background is theater. Actually, I came here and uh, worked in the uh, theater scene in Dallas as an actor, director, stage manager. Was director of the Shakespeare Festival of Dallas and then the Dallas Theater Center, and in that role was hired to come be the director of the Sixth Floor Museum as an arts administrator. Basically, that's the background. And so, what brought you to the museum? Uh, I was hired. <clears throat> I was hired in 1993, and that was a kind of a watershed year for the museum. It was the uh, the point in time we were named the National Historic Landmark District when Dealey Plaza was recognized by the Park Service, the federal government, and uh, there was lots of opportunities uh, coming off the heels of the Oliver Stone film. Attendance was good. Uh, there was, I think, an opportunity to kind of reinvent the museum. We had been through a lot of struggle in the early days, just opening and getting Dallas comfortable with the idea of doing something here. And then uh, given my background as a producer, entrepreneur, it was an opportunity to kind of, kind of look and see what the, other, what the other possibilities were for the site. And so, like, what was different after you came in? Well, I think that the, the, the dilemma the community faced was when you work so hard for so long to basically create an exhibit, to overcome a lot of the opposition in the community to doing anything to mark this spot. This spot is the worst memory in Dallas's life. And uh, so there was a lot of, lot of just uh, concern and, and, and a desire, I think, to make it all go away. And so once the founders had worked so hard over a long time, 12 years, to, to get the museum up and running, get the exhibit up and running, uh, there then was, you know, there, there was the opportunity to then talk about what, what next. Uh, what had happened was we'd opened the exhibit with some expectation, it might run a course of interest. Uh, in fact, in the planning for the, uh, for the sixth floor, there was never a discussion of calling it a museum. It was not going to have a collection. It was simply going to be a, an interpretive exhibit for the tourists who came here anyway. And there might be a point in the future when that interest would die down and it would not necessarily have to be an exhibit anymore. So it was meeting a need for a period of time. By the time I arrived in 93, it was clear that the exhibit was now a permanent aspect or permanent uh, feature of the community and was going to have a long lifespan. The Oliver Stone film had really exploded the interest in the, in the subject matter. Uh, we had evolved a collection, albeit not intentionally. We were doing educational tours. We were doing the things that museums do. And so we looked up and said, oh my God, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's, it's a museum. And so, so there was this whole kind of evolution of, of changing what our expectations were, I think, and realizing there was a horizon beyond the, uh, perhaps the living memory piece of it, that there was plenty of people born after the, assass after the assassination from this was going to be a continuing side of interest and uh, a, a continuing uh, draw for the community. And uh, so you've been in this position since Ten years. Ten years. And so did you, I mean, how, did this, how did this position even come up that you found out about? Uh, I've been at the Dallas Theater Center for five years. Uh, it was a difficult economy. Uh, it was a difficult time at the theater center. I was looking at what else might I do in the community to kind of move on and do something else. I had friends on the board of directors here. Uh, it was not necessarily something that we all thought was a good match to begin with, but after a lot of conversation, I saw there was an opportunity here. Uh, along with uh, theater, I had done pre-law and political science. I had lots of interest in the subject matter as an aficionado, not as an expert, but somebody just kind of read the books on, you know, Kennedy was a hero of mine generationally. And so it was like, you know, I can do this for a while, perhaps give some new ideas, restructure the business plan, look at the financials of the long term, just kind of do, you know, it was a good place to come be. And once I got here and saw the tremendous opportunities of, of exhibition, of creating, you know, more visitation, of expanding exhibition space, publications, film productions, documentaries, so much of that, uh, they were just, it's, 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 10 years has flown by and I feel like we've just begun the, the, you know, all that can be done here. So what does a 
director position actually entail? Well, it, <clears throat> there is, I think, a continuing redefinition of what directors do. Uh, museums evolved kind of, uh, museums evolved from collections, from people having a lot of stuff, let's show the stuff off, to interpretation, what does the stuff mean, to education, how do we learn from it? And so that evolution has got us to this point where directors now are, are, are certainly, hopefully, are, are expert or knowledgeable of the field. But more importantly, in today's environment, know how to operate large organizations, know how to raise money, know how to plan for, for financial ups and downs. So it's, it's a, my job is to, I think, set the, the agenda, set the, the, the strategic plan for the operation, dealing with all the issues of, of simple interpretation, which is education, exhibitions, collections, to marketing development, how do you sell it and how do you have the money to do it, to facilities management and how do you budget for it and how do you, how do you maintain it. So it's, it's, it's that broad range of, of opportunities here, and depending on the time of year, depending on what's going on with the subject, uh, where my focus might be, or how deeply I might be involved in any one of those, uh, those areas. And what guides you in making decisions for the museum? Uh, that's an evolution, too. I mean, you know, what, what guides me, I think, is also driven by time passing. When I came to work here and when the museum was created, the audience was largely seen as being rememberers, those who were alive in 1963. And it's, 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 it's such a searing memory for that generation that, you know, if I'm in conversation in form with anybody on an airplane or cocktail party, whatever, and I say what I do, if they were alive, they've got a story to tell me. And I'm going to hear it in the next five minutes of what they were watching as the world turns, they were in gym class, whatever they were doing, I'm going to hear that story. Fifteen years since we opened, Two-thirds of our visitors were born after the assassination. That's simply the demographics of the country right now. I mean, we just, you know, everybody was born, the large majority. So the challenge, I think, what we're focused on now is how do we engage, how do we honor those who remember and give them an experience which may be cathartic, certainly is one that evokes their own personal memory. And then how do you engage the other two-thirds who are here because it's history to them. It's something they know about because of the ubiquity of Kennedy in the media, because they studied in school. but they're not real sure what the big deal is about. So how do you keep those two audiences engaged? So I think our challenge right now and in the, in the coming years is going to be simply making that balance between those two segments of our audience. And uh, so like, how much do you see the music changing over time if that is the first group yeah. less? Uh, I think I, 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 the museum will change a lot in the industry, the field is going to change a lot. I think that we have, because of economics, because of the, the, the high cost to maintain collections, to have curatorial staff, the overhead has grown so dramatically. Uh, running facilities, in this case the building's 100 years old, and the issues that, that entails. So there's a lot of, of, of I think, just realizing that, that the field has, has changed, and our competition is different. Uh, even 15 years ago, but even five years ago, the kind of History Channel, uh, arts Entertainment, Bravo, the, the, the kind of ubiquity there again in the media of coverage about history. History has become far more remarkable in the last 10 years than it was when I, when I first had this conversation. You know, uh, you have historians who are celebrities, you have a, a, a constant need to kind of go back and revisit video and film of the, of the, the recent past. Uh, I think there's a much more awareness of the commodification of history. And so the challenge, I think, moving forward is simply how do we, how do we recognize that reality? How are we, I think, respectful in this community and, and, and maintain discretion and decorum? Uh, you know, how, how do we simply not overhype or over uh, sell what is a very tragic event, but also recognize there's tremendous interest in that, in that content? So there's a, there's a, there's a constant kind of, I think, uh, of, of kind of tension between the future being one that's going to be recognizing the audience is important, you've got to have income to do it, at the same time, you don't want to be accused of commercialization or selling out or, or profiteering on what is a, a, a tragic event. And, uh, how are, you touched on your role in changing the museum, but how difficult of a process was it initially to get the museum made? The history is pretty, pretty intense because basically by the early 70s, a company was called Texas Cool Book Depository had moved out. They had occupied the building at the time of the assassination. 
They moved to another location in Dallas. The building sat vacant for a couple of years. There was a couple of, there was at least one plan to come in and create that tourist strap to do kind of show an exhibit of Kennedy memorabilia and, you know, kind of capitalize on it. Uh, there was a discussion about maybe maybe tearing the building down and selling it brick by brick, you know, as a way of, you know, creating, creating income. There was a discussion about simply tearing the building down and making a parking lot. And that you know, idea of, of simply demolition was one that the community liked a lot. 75% uh, plus of the audience in 1972 in a Times Herald poll said, tear it down, make it go away. So there, were, there, were, there, was, there was not the kind of unanimity. Now there were certainly people in the community who were preservationists who thought, you know, you can't do that. And there was a reaction to that and that ultimately the city council did not honor, did not grant the demolition permit. By the mid-70s, Dallas County government, which had buildings adjacent to this building, moved forward, acquired the building for additional office space. Now clearly the implication was it was saving it from demolition and preserving it for the future, but there was not a plan sold to the public at that point. It was 77 when the vote was finally for the bond issue to buy the building about doing any kind of exhibit on the sixth floor. So the sixth floor was sealed off. The first five floors over time were converted to offices for commissioner's court and budget offices and the civil section of the DA's office and its county you know, government offices. Uh, the sixth floor took a lot more work to think about. There was a, a group uh, which is called the Dallas County Historical Commission, which exists by virtue of state law, which looked at what you might do, raise money from the National Endowment of the Humanities. They said, let's do some kind of exhibit. It took years of fundraising and massaging and kind of assuring the community wouldn't be a difficult thing. There were plenty of folks around the country and around the world, but certainly around the country, who thought this was a bad idea. Uh, the initial kind of media reaction was, you know, things like the sick idea, it's going to be a monument to a, to a you know, to an assassin, and, and, and there was no good context to understand how you might do something because, you know, it's living memory. I mean, we all knew that Ford Theater was, had, had, you know, been renovated in 64, 65 in Washington, D.C. We knew there was an exhibit there, and that was different. That was history. This was something that we lived through, and how would you ever preserve this site where some, you know, such a bad thing happened here? So once we kind of got through all that, when the museum opened, the expectation was just, you know, very low. And it took a few years of operation, then it took the, the Oliver Stone making the JFK film to kind of spike the attendance, and suddenly there was financial success, there was great visitation, 400,000 people a year, and people in Dallas didn't come, but we had, because of our, our location in a major convention city adjacent to the convention center near the entertainment district, I mean, we were, were, were physically positioned in a way to attract audiences, so we suddenly had crowds from around the country and around the world coming. So how long was it from when the first plans were made until the museum actually opened? The, uh, the initial kind of feasibility studies went on in 1978. And at that point, there was a, a beginnings of a discussion about trying to raise some money. Uh, that went on very, I would say, kind of quietly. I mean, I don't want to say covertly, but quietly until 1981. And when 81 and March of 81, when, when John Hinch Hinckley shot uh, President Reagan, there were connections to Dallas. Hinckley's parents had lived on Beverly Drive in Highland Park. The gun he purchased was purchased on Elm Street in Dallas, which is a few blocks from this, I mean, you know, a few blocks from this building. We're on Elm Street too, but on Elm Street. So Dallas just recoiled from the whole thing. And once more, we were kind of even tangentially uh, tied to an assassination, uh, attempted assassination of President. It wasn't until 84, in 84 when the Republican Convention came to Dallas. Uh, Ronald Reagan was going to be, you know, recoronated. George Bush being running mate, there was no mystery, there was no story. He had 5,000 plus journalists from around the country, around the world here, and they were all down here filming Dealey Plaza and talking to you about what happened here 21 years earlier at that point. And so there was this kind of renewed interest. And then it was in the 86-87 uh, window of time in which the plans were finalized, and then we began construction of Innovation 88 and opened February of 89. And uh, has it been at all a difficult process to expand at seven floors? Say again. Has difficult. Difficult process. To the uh, the opportunity to expand the, the seventh floor. The seventh floor was left vacant after the sixth floor opened. Basically, you had five floors of offices for the county, a sixth floor exhibit space, and then because it was cut off from the the seventh floor, remained as this kind of warehouse and so we had county files that we had our files we had old fixtures old office equipment etc we needed at this time in the in the late 90s more physical capacity 
Our attendance was such that on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, especially in the summer months, you sit in line for about 45 minutes and you weren't always, you weren't having a great experience. It gets crowded, we're six stories in the air, the fire marshal says only 300 people at a time. You know, it's, it's not a great experience. We needed more physical capacity. We also needed uh, a reason for Dallas, Texas to visit the site. If you lived in Dallas, it's like living in Manhattan. You're going to see the Statue of Liberty someday, but you don't, you don't go because it's not going anyplace. And so we knew that Dallas would come eventually. Usually the fifth graders came, the ninth graders came, and you know, parents, you know, the kids would have visited, but the parents had never come. And so doing a, a changing exhibition space where we could do exhibits for six months or eight months or nine months that had a, a, a shelf life. So it's like right now with the Jackie, with the Warhol and Jackie show, it closes October 24th. You want to see it? Come on down. We, we had an opportunity to, to both expand capacity and attract local audience. So that was our, our original ideas for that. And then doing it became actually, you know, pretty straightforward. We had a space. We hired an architect. We went through a process, and we, we built it. Two and a half million dollars later, we had, you know, 9,000 more square feet of space. And so out of the exhibits you've had so far, which is your favorite? Well, we've only had three. I mean, uh, the Pulitzer show opened the, the exhibit, I think, had great public reaction. We did a small show of Stanley Treddick's photos. He was a photographer for Look Magazine in the, in the 60s for and covered President Kennedy. And the Warhol and Jackie show was the first show we've made, and I like them all in different ways. The Pulitzer show, I think, was far more engaging to a, 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 a multi-generational audience. I think the Warhol and Jackie show engages a kind of fine arts audience and kind of a, 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 a fine arts sensibility. I think what we, or what we found, we suspected, is that each exhibition has a way to develop its own market niche and go after a different group than we might have gone after before. So it's going to be a way for us to build audiences in ways that attract different groups of the community, different segments in. If you're here from an out of town, you're going to visit both floors because you're here. But if you're going to come from North Texas, you're going to have some reason beyond just the sixth floor itself that's going to attract you here and going to, you know, the reason you show up. Good question. That's it. Uh, we, we close uh, Warhol and Jackie October 26th, and we have about a three month, a three, three month, a three week window. We're installing a new show called Remembering Jack. Uh, one of the great photographers of the Kennedy era was uh, Jacques Lowe. Jacques made the initial campaign photos of Senator Kennedy, who was running for the presidency. He made pictures of Jackie and Caroline. He was a family photographer. He was given carte blanche in the campaign to travel with the, with, with, with the president on his campaign trips. He made all sorts of candid shots, and his photographs were actually then taken. He would go back to New York, and he would develop them and send them out to the newspapers and the magazines, so they were the source material for the small newspapers and small towns that didn't have their own photographers. So he was creating this kind of visual, iconic image already of John Kennedy, and then once the president became elected, he would access the White House, on, on, and on. Ironically, his 40,000 pictures, which I think most people agree are the finest images of the Kennedy years, were all lost. His negatives were all lost to the World Trade Center, which made a whole nother kind of, 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 of kind of, you know, uh, ironic connection to the tragedy of Dallas. Being friends with his family, knowing Jacques, Jacques passed away actually in, in May of 2001, before the 9-11, uh, there's a new book coming out called Remembering Jack. We're doing an exhibit of those images, which, which would be 600 images totally in the book, half of which have never been published before. Some portion of those never before published images will be on display in the museum. It'll be a show about uh, his coverage of the White House. Very focused on John Kennedy. Now, the other question I'm going to answer is that it is, it is our, I keep doing that like it's like, hello. Um, what, we're, what, we're, what we not struggle with, what, what, we, what we contemplate, what, what we talk about among ourselves is what are the constraints on that seventh floor space for us from our mission standpoint? The Pulitzer show was you know, 130 images, two of which involved Kennedy. One was Kennedy and Eisenhower at Camp David after the Bay of Pigs. The second one was Bob Jackson's picture of Jack Ruby shooting and killing Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, the idea of media coverage, though, is part of the story, and so the Pulitzer show made sense. How broad that, that, that opportunity is, we haven't quite figured out what the boundaries are yet. Uh, clearly, it's a great space to do exhibits in. It's a great space to, to get people, you know, kind of talking and looking at things. And so, what all happens up there is still something we're not. It's something we're we're watching happen every week and every day, and thinking about what else could we do. So I don't know what's going to happen next after the Jack Show. Well, these, my background being theater, 
And in my first year here, I spent time with the, and I can't think of his name, but the, the, the founding director of the Holocaust Museum was actually the director of the, the Theater Tel Aviv for 20 years before he came. And, and there, there's a certain theatrical aspect to exhibitions. And, and more and more we talk about experiences. Uh, and so and experiences are, are obviously visual, they're, they're smell, they're tactile, but there's a, there's a sound component of it. And what we were looking for was a way to engage people in flash, which is 13 images of the, uh, 11 images of the assassination that we have on display, and uh, Mayor Warhol, as well as a created text. It's made to look like a news wire. It's not AP, it's not UPI. It's kind of invented text, albeit accurate. It's just, it's an interesting thing. And if you read that, you kind of get, you know, you, you're reintroduced to the assassination weekend. If you hear it while you're reading it, that redundancy is always helpful to having engage people. You know, it's, it's a way to keep people, you know, their hearing and reading. We also need a transition from Warhol assassination to a kind of understanding of the iconography he created with the images of Jackie. Uh, Andy Warhol was a devout Byzantine Catholic. It's not commonly understood. It's something that we understand from our research about it. The images he made of Jackie after the assassination have a very tight color palette. Warhol was a devout Byzantine Catholic. It's not commonly understood. It's something that we understand from our research about it. The images he made of Jackie after the assassination have a very tight color palette, very constricted. It's not the hyper oranges and reds and greens and yellows he used for Jackie and Liz Taylor and, and other images. It's a very restrained gold, dark blue, black, white images that are, that are actually iconographic in terms of the, the, the Byzantine Catholic Church. So we, we, we knew we wanted to have the sound playing and then we started playing with the idea of chanting it and found out through research that chanting in Byzantine Catholic churches is different than ch chanting in Roman Catholic churches and not Gregorian at something else and so we found this new way of doing it, the longs and the shorts and the how you, how, you know, what, what, the, what the emphasis would be, the stresses would be. And Tim Selig, who was the director of the Dallas, uh, the Torquay Corral here in Dallas, did it for us and we had new material and it, it creates a transition moment. It's, it, it, it is like, you know, it's like the end of an act. It's, it's how you turn a corner and go move to the next idea. So it, it and hopefully it's, it's more subliminal than that. I mean, I think that people who come looking for it hear it and other people kind of remember something was going on at that time. So it, it's not, it's not a real overt statement, but it's a nice transition thing for the exhibition. Transition thing, yeah. <laughs> You've also uh, been changing exhibits in the lobby, mm -hmm. in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Has that always been going on? No, that was uh, the, the one issue that we're still struggling with is that in this business, in the field of museums, especially in this country, uh, there is an inordinate amount of time spent planning for the future. And so museums are often working two and three and four years in advance which we find kind of intellectually and in, in, internally within the museum here is being kind of dull and dumb. So that means that you can't respond to anything what you think is of interest today. If it takes you three or four years to put it up, then who cares, if, three or four years, maybe who cares about it? And our, our, our first prompt was uh, uh, the Elian Gonzalez story a few years ago. And we found through ha having that happen going on, the kid being you know pulled off the raft and his mother dying and should he go back to Cuba or not, and, and there was tremendous ignorance of what the story of Castro and Cuba was. And so we put a show together pretty fast called Unfinished Business, Kennedy and Cuba, which told the history of both Cuba and this country, but then Bay of Pigs and Missile Crisis, on and on and on. Operation Mongoose, which was a CIA plan to assassinate Castro, which Kennedy approved. Uh, the, the, the kind of understanding why Castro was perhaps perceived as somebody who might be trying to kill Kennedy because in the, in the conspiracy theories out there, just laying out very straightforwardly factual basis for a context to understand Elian. That there actually is a question worth asking: Should he go back home? Is Castro, you know, have we forgotten that Castro is a really, a, you know, a, a murderous tyrant who did awful things in the early years of the of, of the revolution in, in Cuba, killed, murdered people. There was the largest migration in this hemisphere of people from one place to another during that period. As people exited, got escaped from Cuba, and came to this country, uh, largely in South Florida, but New Jersey and, and Colorado and Arizona. I mean, just all over the country, they were landing because they were trying to get out from there. And and that kind of immediate, you know, immediate uh, exhibit making was a way of kind of learning how to do something or, or flexing our muscles. And now we have a space we can kind of practice at that's five panels very, very, you know, self-contained and kind of scalable that gives us, I think, the opportunity to think about 
have an idea today we might put on the seventh floor in three months and how would we respond to that so it was a way of, of both engaging the audience telling something that was relevant for the time but also developing internally uh, some processes for creating exhibits and so what other exhibits have you had uh, let's see in the lobby we've done uh, We did the story of this building, 411 Elm. We did the Elian Gonzalez. We did a show called Loss and Renewal, Transforming Tragic Sites. The same kind of thing, because it was done within eight weeks of the attack on 9-11. Uh, we created a show that talked about Ford Theater, Pearl Harbor, Dealey Plaza, the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was killed, Oklahoma City, and then we asked the question about the World Trade Center. So within two months of the attack, we had an exhibit that gave people a context to say, here's what happens. These bad things happen, we organize, there's a way of preserving the site, we come back memorialize, there's museum exhibits, and you know, and, and so this is, what, this is what we may look forward to in the future with the World Trade Center. Uh, and then the, the show here currently is Dealey Plaza, which is a show about the history of the plaza that's also done in a way that helps us. So we're trying to raise about three million bucks to renovate the plaza architecturally and aesthetically and save it uh, structurally. And this is a way that we can actually tell the story of Dealey Plaza, which is much, much larger than just the assassination, albeit that's what it's perhaps best known for. Uh, and out of those exhibits, do you have any particular favorites? I think Lost Renewal. I mean, Lost Renewal is uh, Lost and Renewal Transforming Tragic Sites on our website. Uh, I think that people, I think that we were able to in a short amount of time deal with some real substantial ideas that helped our staff and helped our audience understand what was going to happen. And that that kind of rapid response, albeit eight weeks, but rapid response in museum terms, gave us, I think, a lot of confidence to move forward in other projects. So it's it was it's my favorite process because it was one where we had we'd planned the Dealey Plaza exhibit. We had it basically all laid out and I came in one morning and said we're not doing that and and for the staff, there was some actually some tears of, oh, God, we've worked so hard for, you know, and now we're doing something else, but it was the right thing to do. And I think that once we did it all, and everybody kind of, it kind of, you know, caused everybody to kind of, it was a call to arms. And, you know, get the phones out, get the email out, let's see what we're going to do, and let's go after it, and, 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 uh, and we'll know what it is in six days or seven days, and then once we do this, we'll figure out what, you know, and, and it, was, it was a quick process, but I think a very good one for us. How long have you uh, early, God, at 95 probably, 93, 94, 95. We, you know, we're JFK.org, so the fact we could actually have that website address shows you how, f how early we bought it because it was like 35 bucks when nobody knew what websites were. And uh, initially it was uh, just to have a web presence for directions and ticket prices and that sort of stuff. And, and now we're moving toward the collection being online and being able to access 3D images and a whole lot of raft of things. I mean, our dilemma is that we have about 75,000 unique visitors to the, to the website every month. And that's a lot, and we feel good about that. And so it's kind of, you know, where, where do we spend our energy and our time, you know, because a website could become, we could be only the website, frankly. I mean, there, 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 there's enough content and work we could do on that website. So it's, it's having the time to get it all done, I think, is our challenge. What other uh, things does the museum do as far as, like, book signings and lectures? And the... the uh, the challenge of integrating ourselves more fully into the community's life is doing things that people are comfortable with. Often a speaker or a special guest or someone from out of town, people are afraid to bring them here. It's like we have more to so, show to you than where Kennedy got shot, yet this is where they want to be. And so we're constantly trying to find the, 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 the comfort level for the audience to come through events here. We're doing more public programs. We bring in special speakers. We have book signings. We, 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 we have debate, and you know, internally we have programs, public programs, they're called. Uh, and we're we're only now kind of seeing how we can build a renewing audience. Uh, we are not, at this point, we aren't membership driven. We don't have an annual campaign. We don't have some of the the, the component pieces that many museums have that create that same kind of community buy-in. We don't need to. Number one, we're we're largely earned revenue driven. And secondly, we don't know what the market's like for that, or we have concerns the market's not as deep as we wish it were for all the effort it would take to put a membership program together. I mean, if people are really going to come back on a regular basis to see things. In four or five years, I think we'll be better suited because we'll have then a good track record of changing exhibits and people have seen other things here and been here for other events and that sort of thing. So we're, we're sensitizing the community over the next five years to really get used to the idea of, of, of how we integrate. So that's, that's the challenge for us is 
doing enough that we're on the radar screen, but not so much that people feel like we're pulling focus or being inappropriate. It's a funny thing. I mean, uh, uh, we, 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 we do a special events on the seventh floor, for example. We have a, a place you can come and have a corporate meeting. Uh, it's about the exhibit. So, you know, you do a reception to a dinner or whatever, but it, I mean, the idea is that you come, we have nonprofits who use it for fundraisers, but you're seeing the Warhol and Jackie show, or you're seeing the Pulitzer Prize show. It's all part, it's integrated. But they were, we're criticized for that. Some people wish, you know, think we shouldn't do events at this site. This site should be re more reverential. So we're, we're constantly trying to, I guess, push the edge of the envelope, but not not break it open or not you know, not not screw up real bad. You know, I'm trying to find a balance in that. I spent all my life trying to find balance. Oh my God. Well, it, it's, it's intriguing because what we have here is an institution that returns cash to Dallas County in rentals and fees and commissions. We receive no government subsidy, no direct support from any government, U.S., state, city of Dallas, whatever. And I think that often there is an expectation that's the appropriate way to do things. We're earned revenue driven. When we did the $2.5 million expansion, we went to the bank and borrowed money. And we paid, we're paying, we have an amortized note that we pay, uh, you know, we, we pay every year. So I think that, that as you travel around the country, as I go to you know, Lowe's City Place and I spend eight fifty now for a ticket to go to the movies on a Friday night, 10 bucks is, 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 is the highest we get. We have you know, then group rates and senior rates and student rates, whatever. Uh, I think it's exactly where it should be and probably could actually be more if we, if we got aggressive about it, but I think it's, it's appropriate. And people who are concerned about the ticket prices would also be concerned if their tax dollars were subsidizing something. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a funny mentality I, I come up against. That, uh, that if I see, you know, that maybe it should be free, well then where's the money going to come from? And well, not the government, because that's tax dollars. So we, we go back and forth about that. But we're, uh, we, we have in our testing of it and our surveying of it, found that we are not, uh, that, 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 that there's, not, there's not that much price resistance. People, when they come to the experience and we're not ticketing separately from the sixth or seventh floor, I mean, that, that you really can come and spend a good three or four hours here, you've had a pretty good experience. I mean, I'll be curious. I mean, I want to know when all this settled or, you know, we can talk after we finish this. Part of it. I don't know what other people said about things. What their thinking was about that. If they thought that it was just overpriced or should be cheaper because it's a, the site it is. If they, I, I, the question is, is, are they getting their money's worth? Or they think it should be cheaper because it's we Kennedy got shot and therefore it should be available to more people? Um, some people just thought the museum, a couple of people thought the museum just should be free. Mm -hmm. When you begin there, it's kind of hard to talk about how much more you can charge. <laughs> and, uh, there, there were a couple people who were saying that they thought that the museum should be free because it was free. Was that a line? It's just where the money's going. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's something we can probably come up with some didactic information or on the back of a ticket or something, explain whether, you know, that no. Government subsidy. I mean, I think it's a way to answer that question. Any kind of, anyway, we've had probably half a dozen people in 10 years talking to the office and say, you're charging too much money. And five minutes later, they're like, oh, cool, can I give you more? You know, it's, as long as I hear it's, it's not, as you say, not lining somebody's pocket or something, not, not, not profiteering. But it's given us, I mean, what, what the ticket prices have done for us, this relationship that we have with Dallas County is atypical. Uh, museums often are built by government entities. They're subsidized by government entities. They're given property. They're given buildings or, you know, bond money, whatever. Because we are self-sufficient to the extent we return monies to Dallas County, it creates, I think, a certain integrity in what we do here and a certain kind of, of, of opportunity for us to be as, as unbiased as possible. We're not a governmental institution doing something that we have to go through government, you know, kind of processes to get approval for. We're able, I think, to be more responsive and more uh, proactive in doing things we might not do otherwise, given some other constraints. And we know that, that our, our success and doing other things is going to be subsidized by our success as an audience. Uh, you know, if you have a museum which is free or cheap and, and what we pride ourselves on, we don't rely upon box office to subsidize us, then what you do usually, or more often than not, has little of anything to do with what the audiences might want to see. It's curatorial, uh, I think, val uh, vanity. It is, it is, it's, it's small-minded. It, we, we wind up with doing things which are of interest to a very small group that are then thrown up on the walls or put out for an exhibition and the public doesn't come, it's like because the public is stupid. Uh, we clearly understand that we're doing an exhibition here, we want to make sure we can sell tickets at the same time, not why it's not the primary goal. It is certainly a consideration that says we're going to do a show, it better have some attractiveness because we rely upon the box office during that period to pay the bills. So it, it creates I think, a, a certain kind of discipline which is very health, healthy for us.
What, what am I? It's wider. Am I drooping? No. I think uh, it just kind of came up a little oh, bit. All right. I'm I can start to see it. All right. There's more? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can I go to the bathroom, actually? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take, take, take a minute here. Can I unplug this yeah. nut? Oh, I feel much better now. Okay. I won't talk so fast. <laughs> so, Matt, you touched on a little bit difficulties on having your building. Mm -hmm. Could you find one a little more? I know I was here one day and the power went out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the, the one issue we face is if the county owns the building, we occupy a portion of the building, and so there's always going to be those issues where you, the county maintenance concerns perhaps are not as... There are different levels of concern. When we when we renovated the seventh floor, we actually replaced all the HVAC systems for the sixth and seventh floor because as you get in the business of showing artifacts or showing fine art, there are many issues of climate control, humidity levels, and things that simply aren't called upon in just a public building. And so there's a different set of needs. Uh, being in an old building is, is, is difficult, and uh, and so we have we have just you know long-term strategies for how we're going to subsidize things, pay for things. It's going to be an ongoing uh, expense burden for us forever. Well, that's well, actually it was a TXU power issue, which was kind of, it, it was like two blocks away where something happened and then there was a chain reaction and things got blown up. And what we deal with now is obviously is our, the, you know, the counties in a co-op, which buys power from, I think, Reliant. This is not public. I mean, so there's like this, there's a third party in the middle and TXU services. So it, it's just harder these days to know who's at fault when things happen. But there's a lot of construction going on nearby and there was some transformer overload and something popped and then we got the kind of repercussions over a, about, actually about a 13 hour period of things not working and power being surged and all that sort of stuff. Spiking, they call it, you know. And, uh, what, have, uh, what surprised you about working here? What was not what you expected to be here? I guess the most surprising thing was a sense that perhaps everything had been done when I got here, that we'd kind of done what had to be done and there was nothing else to do. And for the community, for civic leadership, for anybody, you know, it's like, well, what, what else can you do with that? You've done it. And then 10 years later, we've done so much more than we ever thought about doing and there's so much more to do. I mean, I, I think that, that it's a 40-year-old current event that in 2003, I can sit here and have, you know, 15 exhibit ideas, all of which would be terrific that we, can't, we could do in the next year and make sense, but we can't do them all. I mean, there's, there's so many opportunities. I think that the interest is so so striking that the paradigm of the assassination, whether it's about learning about how the media came of age, how the Constitution works, how we as a country deal with tragedy, there, there's there are big kind of big ideas, which are are unlike other history environments where the you know it's about a, one event that happened and there and, and the kind of, uh, of of antecedents for it or the comparisons after the fact. I mean, there's a lot for us to talk about. When 9-11 took place uh, that morning, within 30 minutes, I heard Peter Jennings say, it's just like the day Kennedy got shot. We'll never forget when we heard, where we were when we heard that the, the, the World Trade Center had been attacked. And it was like that, that evocation was constant then for the next you know, week of constant news coverage and, the, and, and people making the comparison. So it is something that, that it's a dynamic environment we're here. And I think that, that, that I've, I, I, there's been a real evolution seeing what the, what the, there's a lot of potential beyond what we've done in 93 and we've done even in 2003. There's a lot more to be done, a lot more work. And uh, is there anything that's been particularly difficult? Uh, I, the, same, the same thing. I mean, basically getting people to recognize there's more to be done. Uh, there, is a, there was, a, I think, a, a, a hope perhaps that we would just do it, have done it, and go away, and that we've done it, there's more to be done, and that for not going any place has been a little distracting some, to, I think, to some civic leaders for whom this is the worst memory, and talking about it is not the way they like to spend their time. Uh, but it is as much as the fabric of the city as the Chicago fire, the San Francisco earthquake, I mean, Oklahoma City, God knows, you know, you can't not talk about this event in a way of understanding how Dallas has evolved from what it was to what it is in 2003. Uh, I find it absolutely challenging, and every day is different, and lots of new ideas, and it, it's it, it's 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 exhausting.
And rewarding, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to be done. How many members of your staff actually remember the assassination? Oh, I would say probably less than, let's see, there probably, we have 50, 78 on staff, maybe 10 or 12 of us. Uh, and, and, and that's a really important thing that we're very much aware of. We, we're able to focus group often internally, you know, albeit informally, but you can kind of ask a question and you see where, I mean, when, when the, we had the idea for the uh, Kennedy and Cuba show. And when I began to say to people, where's Cuba and what's a communist and who's Castro and the kind of, not necessarily glazed looks, but like, you know, I kind of know, but there wasn't really any kind of, you know, internal knowledge that Cuba had been a very scary place. It was 90 miles off the coast of Miami that we might have died from the bomb. I mean, we, there's, an, there's an abstraction to that part of our history. I think that, that, that we, uh, that, 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 that since the Berlin Wall fell, the kind of fear that permeated our society for many years, what the Cold War was all about, has been lost on a, on a, on a younger generation who don't really think about the communists as being that big a deal or that big a threat and, and know it was back there in the past, but it was back there in the past, but yet this was the, the Kennedy uh, administration and, and part of our fear even the day of the assassination was this is some kind of communist plot, that something bad is happening where we're now going to be compromised as a country, that we're, you know, we, we, had, we had Air Force planes in the air, we were flying around trying to see where the, where the missiles are coming from. This could be the beginning of a, of a coup d'etat or, you know, a, a major kind of, you know, oh, takeover, we, it was a fear. And that was legitimate first kind of impulse to think, what's, what, what bad thing are the commies trying to do here? Because just 13 months before the assassination, they had bombs 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So, I mean, it was, it, it was, a, it was a very real fearful time, and I think that's been the, the challenge of getting our staff to understand that and hopefully, and how we, how we then, you know, pass it on to the visitors who don't remember but can kind of get a better sense of the, of the drama than perhaps they've gotten from a, a, a more cursory understanding of the events. back, what was your impression of Kennedy when he was still president? Uh, total idealism. I mean, I, I think that even since I've been here, understanding far more intimately the inner workings of the administration, that he was in many ways a conservative cold warrior by today's standards. So the kind of things he was were concerned about was absolutely uh, uh, pragmatic, that his uh, vision of going to the moon was because the Russians might get there first. You know, and so we're going to beat those bastards and get them before they, before, before, you know, get them before they get there. I mean, th 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 there, there was politics in play all the time. Uh, that he was certainly, uh, I think, you know, visionary and, and, and idealistic, but he was also very pragmatic. And uh, and so at the time, he was he was uh, almost uh, ideal. And now I think he's he's very much a you know product of his era and product of his time. And we understand that better. We, there's still high drama and still great loss when we, you know at, at the time of the assassination. So tell me. Oh God. Okay. Uh, I was young. I was five years old, so I'm 45 now. Uh, and my mom, because I had three older sisters who went to school then, on every Friday there was a thing at the Bama Theater in Tuscaloosa, Alabama called the Ladies Home Shopper Matinee for all those women who didn't have jobs. And so you go to the movies at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that morning we saw Bells Are Ringing with Judy Holliday and Dean Martin. And, uh, and our tradition was, since I was five years old, one more year before I had to start school, we would go to the movies at 10 o'clock, and after the movies, we'd go to the Burger in a Hurry, which was the first fast food place in, in, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And so we were actually standing in line. It's probably 12.40, 12.35, 12.40, because we'd left the movies. We'd run an errand, gone by the shoe store, and we're standing in line, and the ladies, two ladies in front of us were talking, and one lady says, well, was Jackie hurt? And the other lady said, I don't know. And mother said, what are you talking about? I said, well, honey, haven't you heard our president's been shot? Now, I was a precocious uh, five-year-old who had a framed picture of John Kennedy in my bedstand. I had three older sisters who were trying to make me be this wonderful, perfect kid. So I was, who's the president, who's the vice president? I had pictures, flashcards, it's tragic. And, uh, and so I went to Listerics. I was like, oh my God, you know, and then I remember going home and watching TV and Cronkite. I remember all that stuff very clearly. And how it was this, I mean, this kind of looking at the sky, wondering when the, when the, when the, when the planes are coming. Our next neighbor was an FBI agent. And so uh, we were aware of how fast things were called up, how fast people were going into kind of an attack mode or, 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 or you know, a protection mode. And so it was, it was, it was a fearful time, uh, clearly, then, 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 you know, and it was, it was very, very awful and, and it kind of consumed everything for four days, completely. There you have it, the story, the end. How long is this thing going to be?
Yeah, Bob Dylan. Eighteen hours of this one. <laughs> I don't think my professor will let me go. Yeah, I hope not. Good. <laughs> Have to show some restraint. Okay. Can you tell me what you think, looking back historically, Kennedy's position relative to other presidents? And it's always going to be hard to know. I mean, basically, you have with Kennedy a couple of, 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 of outstanding factors. One, that he was a, he was had won by a slim margin, yet had within three or four months of taking office really captured the public imagination. He was a, he was a fairly powerful, influential politician. I mean, this guy had had charisma, and and as that as a result, he was he was really connecting with the population. He was not connecting well with the Congress. And so there was little, lots of battles to be fought, and he was very focused on the second term as a way of kind of laying things out there. So I think that, that, that the major issues of, of, of the Kennedy administration are issues that were only resolved after his death, uh, and, and resolved being that there was a Civil Rights Act in 64 that was contemplated under President Kennedy but became a far different document, and the fact it got done in 64 was only because John Kennedy had died. It was part of that commemoration of, of the Congress. You have the Vietnam War, which we can argue and will be argued forever what he would have done had he lived. And I don't think that it is conclusive at all what might have happened. But certainly how it escalated after his assassination is a way of understanding the 60s. I mean, you have in Kennedy a president who was an effective cold warrior at a time that's what the country required and was probably far more uh, moderate by today's standards and he's ever been, I think, in, in, in kind of popular conversation ever gets, gets recognized for being. He was not a liberal. He was hardly, you know, he, he was a patrician, you know, Bostonian, I mean, to, to a large extent. But he certainly had the public's ear. He was a very articulate, I think, I think a very engaging personality in ways that we, except perhaps for Reagan in, in the 80s, who we've not had in this country since him. So, so I think that, that we evaluate him as a great president with a great deal of unrealized goals or un unrealized uh, pro uh, public uh, programs uh, at the time of his death. I mean, I think that there was a, it was, it was a moment where, you know, a thousand days is not a long time. He would, you know, another year might, might have turned a lot, lot, been perceived a lot differently. But as it was when he died, that deification, that, myth, that, that, that uh, mythologizing that had happened at that, I think, is always going to color how, he, how his presence is perceived. It's kind of hard to separate the two, I think. With any kind of uh, rational you know, discussion, because you just don't know. Otherwise, you you've got to pr predict in the future what would what would have happened. Switching gears, what do you know uh, on George Bannerman's view? Uh, in terms of, in terms of his place in he was born in. Uh, uh, I think I think that yeah, uh, I think Dealey is is actually one of the great heroes of Dallas for a variety of reasons. I I, I think Dallas struggles with an identity crisis. And there's a great deal about this community which I think is absolutely terrific and exciting and engaging that, that I wouldn't say all people, but I think there's a resistance to telling stories that are, that are perhaps not, you know, uh, are perceived as being a uh, lot not favorable. So you have in George, uh, uh, let's do a George Dealey story, George Benjamin Dealey. I mean, basically the Federal Reserve decides they need to build a new bank in Texas. Where is it going to be? They send two guys out to kind of look for, to visit the appropriate Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, the sites. Well, Dealey finds out what train they're on leaving Kansas City and puts two of his guys on the train with them. And they sit with these guys for hours, drinking, playing cards, talking, and selling Dallas. And when they get to Dallas, these guys love Dallas, and Dallas winds up being the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's, 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 it was a politicking thing. It was, you know, it wasn't graft and the corruption. It was just how we did things. It's like, you know, when, when, our, our, when, when, when we went, went and got the uh, state fair, I mean, we, we, we write checks. We, we, you know, we have, we, we, Dallas is about the deal. Dallas is about, you know, having a vision and, and having, the, having the balls to go and, you know, and get it. And George Dealey, George Dealey is all about that. You know, he had a vision of what Dallas could be. He was willing to, to say we need to, you know, do some aggressive city planning things, bring in Kessler, do the Kessler plan, talk about what expansion infrastructure needs to look like. I mean, he was, he was ahead of his time, but he was also, you know, economic, saying what's going to make us, you know, important, what's going to make us valuable, what's going to, you know, you know make us a, 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 a value to the, to the country. So I think it's great that it actually he's the Plaza thing better him, and he's, he's probably one of, the, one of the icons of certain, or is one of the icons of our city's history for all the right reasons. He was a deal, he was a deal maker. I think clearly, part if you've seen the Dealey Plaza book, you 
you know, in the exhibit. I mean, part of what this whole renovation, I think, is going to re-involve the community with, with what the history of Dealey Plaza is. The assassination is the most important event in Dallas's history, and it took place in Dealey Plaza, so it's the most important event in Dealey Plaza's history. But Dealey Plaza had a history before and after. Certainly before, and that it was the new gateway to, 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 to Fort Worth. It was a way we, we, we had of kind of creating a sense of place, sense of entrance from coming from the west into the city. Uh, it had issues of transportation, of getting the railroad tracks up in the air above. We, we took out streets, we, we put in levees, we did all sorts of things to create a, a, a more productive transportation system for Dallas. And, and Dealey Plaza was, was that, you know, was, was the fulcrum of that whole, that whole endeavor. Uh, after the fact, I think it's a place that people, because of the tragic events here, still come to understand more about Dallas. It's a place you can learn a lot about Dallas, about its founding and about, about its, uh, its maturity. Do you think the new uh, renovation will be read in the new museum? I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I think there's an opportunity there, but I'm still, not, I'm, I'm still concerned that we, that we deal with history as jingoistic and kind of happy talk, and we, and we don't kind of deal with some of the challenging aspects. I mean, Old Red had lynchings. There was, you know, tremendously complicated com things that happened there. Uh, that I think is are part of our history too. That we that we can't not. We, I, I think I think Dallas, like most cities, wants to ignore anything negative and focus on the positive. But sometimes it's, it's to the detriment of the. I think respect and understand the complexity of what we are as a city. Do you get a sense that the people <coughs> doing old red don't want to have those things? I, I I get a sense that that we have tried in Dallas, Texas, with the old city park, with the Hall of State. We, we we do history in lots of different places, and we keep trying to redo it in a certain way. And I don't think we've ever really embraced, I mean, this, this site especially, I don't think we've ever embraced the, 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 the difficulty of our identity and, and who we are. And, so, and, and, and I don't think that, regrettably, we do a good job when people move from other places of giving people a sense that Dallas has a history that's worth understanding more deeply and, 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 and studying. So I hope they can do that. I'm not convinced that that's going to happen. No. What do you think of, uh, kind of the way things have developed in this kind of subculture? Well, you know, Lee Jackson's line, Lee, uh, was, you know, that what we do upstairs the Smithsonian, what happens down here is Graceland. And, and I'm of two minds about it. Uh, I, I, I can be very, I think, uh, annoyed and, and a little righteous that we shouldn't have people out there selling autopsy photos or talking about what they've done. And it's kind of a tattered kind of folding table, uh, you know, uh, portable way of doing history. On the other hand, I'm, I'm fascinated that Forty years later, you have a place people go and want to unfold their tables and tell stories and engage people and try to try to you know find meaning in something. Uh, so I don't know if it's an aesthetic dis, you know dislike or an aesthetic annoyance, but 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 I do like the idea that we're still talking, that people have you know feel so deeply about something they're willing to go and spend their day standing in the sun trying to help people believe or convert people to their way of thinking often you know or here's what I believe or or here's my five dollar you know newspaper but I you know this is something I feel about uh, you know and so so I think I think letting it exist is probably a good thing too. You know, I haven't been there since I think I was there probably the week it opened, and and I think that there is, uh, uh, in the same way, I'm intrigued that it exists. I'm intrigued about what the audience is anymore. I don't know kind of what their success is like, whatever. I think it speaks to people's need to find meaning in this awful event, and that will drive conversation about this forever. Because I don't think we're ever going to answer the question of what really happened to anybody's absolutely intellectual satisfaction. Uh, well, personal reaction, I mean, the same way Dealey Plaza, I mean, those are both sites that I found by accident when I was in Dallas when I first moved here. I didn't really go looking for them. I got lost on Ross Avenue one night and wound up down Dealey Plaza 20 years ago. Oh, my God, it's Dealey Plaza because I, I recognized it. And then I think later, driving by, I always knew there was a flame flickering in the middle of the memorial. Just in my mind's eye, I just knew there was a flame there. And when I get there, there's no flame. I'm like, where's the flame? You know, it's, it's just, you know, you, you have kind of, kind of mental images of things. Uh, my reaction to it was it's very sterile, it's very cold, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, 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 an appropriate memorial to what this awful event. Having now researched it, studied it, dealt with the architect, understand a lot more about the aesthetics of why it is what it is. I think it is also all the things I've talked about, but also a really powerful evocation of Dallas's uh, uh, reaction to the assassination. I think it was something that was so complicated and so dense that it took almost a modernistic abstraction to, to, to kind of uh, personify it. And the memorial does that, I think. It really 
so, you know, we gave a block of downtown real estate, which is a hell of a great compliment to give to anybody, but we were unable to really figure out what it is we were trying to do with the memorial. Uh, we were resistant to memorialize the man, so there's no statue. We didn't want to have the words on the wall because that was somehow memorializing him, and we still wanted to argue a bit about his validity as a leader. I mean, there was still, I think, an antagonism this, in this in this city about he was, you know, he was not a great guy in some respects. I mean, there was there were certainly people didn't like John Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, didn't like his politics. And so we, we, we kind of battled about how do you preserve it. I mean, Dallas is probably one of the few cities in the, in the world that doesn't have a street named for John Kennedy or a, a major building, you know, and that, and that kind of, you know, raft of things being named in the year after the assassination from Cape Canaveral to the, you know, John Kennedy Airport in, at Idlewild. I mean, it's nothing like that in Dallas because that was our own way of struggling with it. And so I, I think it, it is absolutely a, a tremendous kind of a... a physical reminder of the uh, complexity and the difficulty of this, of this subject for this community. You uh, were involved in helping to renovate mm -hmm. that, correct? <coughs> how, how did that come about? Well, I mean, uh, because like Dealey Plaza, uh, it's a public park that has no soccer moms to worry about it. We wind up worrying about it because we're at the sixth floor, a constituency who's here all the time. And the memorial has the same kind of absence of local, uh, uh, local advocacy, if you will. And so there was actually a period of time we were looking at it, remember what to do. It, had been, it was in disrepair. Then there was an attack with the attack. It was, it was, there was graffiti placed on it, so we had to go through a whole process of, you know, what do you do to preserve what is a complicated uh, structure? It's made out of cast stone. It's not, you know, it, it's falling apart in some places. So we, we put together a whole plan. We brought in Philip Johnson, the original architect. We talked with him. We did all sorts of research, and we were able to develop a plan to, re to renovate it. And now we maintain it regularly, so it's getting serviced all the time. It's getting coated with the things that keep the graffiti off of it. Its uh, light bulbs are being replaced, and we we, we clean it periodically. So it, it, I think it's a, it's a better memorial than it was prior to our involvement. That was our goal. And uh, oh, that was just the first page. Jesus, wow. Harrison Christ. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Can you tell me what's the craziest conspiracy theory you've ever been told? Uh, I have two favorite ones about that. Uh, one is that clearly that, uh, that that you know Kennedy had Addison's disease, which is a, a, a I would adrenal gland disease. I can't think of what it was, uh, and and he had. His his he had he had health problems. We even the new recent Dalek book talks about his health problems. So there was a, there is a notion that perhaps anticipating his early death, that Joe Kennedy paid to have him killed so they could make a martyr out of him. That's my f and then the second one has to do with Gerald Ford. And Ford, of course, was a representative from uh, from Michigan and wound up on the Warren Commission. That's a Republican. And then years later, once he became president, ooh, he was rewarded for his Warren Commission by being made president. You know, the triad, you know, intervenes, whatever. Uh, there were two attacks made on him by Squeaky Frome and Sarah Jane Moore, uh, two attempted assassinations. That that was all part of a plan to uh, kind of reiterate or to iterate the 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 the, uh, the lone gun, the lone nut theory. So it was a way of kind of reinforcing Lee Harvey Oswald probably was a lone nut who acted alone. So Ford walked around outside and got shot at twice, so he could have people believe that reinforce the, the, the Warren Commission findings. So I think they're both just absolutely out the, you know, off, off the charts and how stupid they could be, but people believe these things and that, that, they're, that fact that they are involved that deeply I think is another kind of, you know, at least signpost trying to understand what the impact of the assassination was. People care that deeply about something. Have you seen the Oliver Stone film? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you think of it? Uh, great movie making, uh, powerful, bad history. Uh, I don't think, you know, I, 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 coming from the theater, know that Julius Caesar is largely inaccurate about this, you know, about the killing of Caesar. I mean, I, I think that, 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 that literature and movies and novels often kind of reinvent and re evoke and, and tie things together in ways that make uh, cinematic sense or, 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 or structural sense or a Sicilian, you know, vers verisimilitude. I mean, we, we try to make something work. Uh, and so to the extent that it, that it was, I think, a major impact on the, on, on the story itself, it re-energized re an audience that perhaps had not known the assassination story. It was a prompt for the Records Review Board, the work of the government, to release a lot more documents and to create a larger collection, I think, for the, for the his for history. All that's good. History is bad. I mean, the things, I mean, I think he could have done, I think it's sloppy at times, but it certainly is compelling. Somebody's either taping something, I don't know. <laughs>
Uh, one other thing I noticed over there about the Kennedy Memorial is mm-hmm. there's a like a memorial to fallen police officers, mm-hmm. and almost all the names are very difficult to read, except for Tippett. I've never noticed that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, I mean, my suspicion, I need to go look at it. My suspicion, if you look at the monument here and how we have allegedly underlined on the side of the building, and we fix it about every six months, <coughs> and it comes back. And so there may be somebody for whom keeping Tippett's name clear is part of it, or certainly that there's, that's a name that he will go to. I don't know. I think it's one of those little under, you know, subcultural things you will understand more about. Questions, but I'm going to just change this. Well, I'm going to go to the restroom again, damn it. You're going to be crazy. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 I, I guess my, my dilemma often is that I'm as much interested by the process as I am by any result. And I'm intrigued that if we're talking about it 40 years later. I don't know if there's anything, that's, anything will come of it. I don't know if I think, we, you know, she would lead the charge. I don't think so. It's something I think that there again is part of understanding, or at least uh, maybe not understanding, at least contemplating Dallas's uh, relationship with this event. Not, 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 not deeply at all. I mean, we know what's going on. We're, we're encouraging it. It's going to be something once it's up and running. We may do some, you know, marketing things with that kind of, co- you know, coordinate with, with differently. But uh, we have, because we have plenty of things to work on here, we've not, we're not deeply involved with the planning of it now. Marketing things as far as like buying a ticket for both? Uh, maybe student, student tours, uh, mailings, you know, that we kind of reference the two. I mean, there's a, you know, when you, when you deal with the group tours, especially school groups, I mean, you know, if you can do some synergies of, you know, mornings there, afternoons here, lunch at Spitty Warehouse, and you know, something you want to go out and do. So we'll, we'll see what those opportunities are when they come along. And, uh, I know it sounds highly speculative, but just your personal speculation of if Kennedy hadn't died here in Dallas. For who? <laughs> for where? For what? Had Kennedy lived, what would happen? I don't do that well. I, I, I think that, that, that uh, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? That's a Newt Gingrich thing, right? Had the, had the South won the Civil War or something? I don't care. They didn't. Uh, what do you think the, uh, well, for the anniversaries, what I'm just giving, have you been through a few anniversaries now? Five-year anniversary, marker anniversaries. What are they like? Well, a couple of things. One, one is that the family asked in the early '80s that they wish we wouldn't remember the day he was killed. They wish we remember his birthday. And that was their desire. At the same time, I think if you look at dates like December 7th or June 6th or April 19th or 9/11, I mean, there are dates we all know where we were when things happened. And November 22nd will be for a long time in this country's life still something that we talk about and it's when we recognize his death. We do nothing on that date in a public way. We certainly have had events, maybe a symposium, maybe something around that time. But on the day, we, we, the museum is open and we just kind of watch what happens. There's always a gathering on Dealey Plaza. There's always somebody with a megaphone or a PA system giving a speech. There may be a prayer. There's, there, there's kind of ragtag things happening. And I find that also just as interesting as anything we might go and formalize and go and create. I think it's, it, it's, it's a, speaks to people's need to assemble, the, to kind of share, and, and, and often it's conspiracy driven. It's about, you know, how many people, witnesses were murder, the government is covering up, whatever. I mean, and, and that's all part of letting that, letting that day be what it is. But we don't do anything spe- specifically on that day to, to mark the date. So do you do anything for his birthday? No, no, because there again, it, 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 it seems, we, 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 we have a, we walk a thin line because John Kennedy's life and legacy and story is told in Boston at his museum. Yet you can't really understand the assassinations in fact without understanding his life. So we're constantly trying to have enough that kind of meets the need of explaining the context, but not so much that we're trying to, to uh, supplant what's going on in Boston. So we, we, we try to 
be as balanced as we can be. Um, what do you think the future holds for Dating Plaza? 50 years from now, 100 years from now, is this going to be its <coughs> primary draw? The, 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 the remarkable thing for me, I mean, I've worked in the theater before, I've worked in Frank Lloyd Wright design buildings, I've worked in, you know, a, around a lot of stuff, you know, important structures. And any of those structures could be bulldozed tomorrow and there might be a hue and cry, but you look out the window here in my office, Dealey Plaza will not change the next 500 years. It's not going any place. It's not going to be, you know, bulldozed over and, you know, made a parking lot or made a, you know, to a hotel. I mean, it, it is a permanent part of the city's fabric. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see in 100 years or 200 years as people, you know, a million people plus go to the Ford Cedar every year. You know, Lexington and Concord have visitors. So does the, you know, the, the, the Coliseum or the Acropolis. I mean, you know, we go to these historic sites and, and it's hard, I think, in 2003 to think about this site as being on par. This is not one of the wonders of the world, but it certainly is one of the, 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 the signposts for a century. Uh, the you know the, the the American century, the 20th 20th century, and I, th I think there will be people coming here in 500 years who will see this structure just as we see it today. We'll see the the colonnades and the pergolas and the grass and understand what took place here, and that will go on forever. And, uh, we'll be charging more money then, but. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you uh, have a political affiliation? Not that I'm going to talk to you about on camera, no. I mean, believe in God? No, I'm just saying. Yeah, I believe in God, actually. <laughs> so you don't share your political views? Not, 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 not on camera, no. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything, uh, oh, one last thing. Were you, uh, did you view any of the gathering of people and, and such when John Kennedy Jr. died? Yep. What about it? What was it like? Well, it, it was... It's a surreal time. I mean, obviously, uh, it was another great tragedy in the Kennedy's legacy, in the Kennedy's family's life. Uh, and and for people to come on a Saturday morning and then hear about the fact the plane was missing at this site, and having that linkage forever in their minds. And and if you lived in Dallas and you had some deep affinity, I mean, this was a place you would come to. So there were flowers out on the plaza. It was a, another place where things, you know, kind of spontaneous outpourings were. Of, of, of tchotchka. I mean, you know, we, Memorial had teddy bears and little, little bizarre, little, little model airplanes, which I thought was just very strange. And you know, but it was it was another kind of uh, of, of populist understanding of the impact of the, of the of the Kennedy mystique on the population. So it was it was a fascinating time. What happens? Though? Well, <clears throat> the flowers we throw away, but uh, the 3D artifacts in, in that instance were were. were putting up collection, acid-free boxes, and indexed and catalog, and they're in the collection, and probably at some point in 10 years or 20 years, 30 years, when we're talking about the, the impact of the whole uh, Kennedy and, uh, uh, family, that we'll have an exhibit which will incorporate some of those, uh, those small artifacts as a way of understanding what took place here in 1999. Is there anything that I've neglected? I don't think so. <laughs> Jesus, you know. <coughs> Not on camera. <laughs>